in, in Guatemala, in Chichicastenango. I, I know they have an alcaldía for the, for the traditional, and then they have the alcaldía oficial. And it seems like the, the same sort of thing. And there were a lot of, I know a lot of refugees from Guatemala during that war, uh, internal war that they had there. I'm wondering if they, some of those went there to influence this uh, movement. And also, you didn't say anything about the Communist Party. I think you mentioned Communists once. And I'm just, I'm just wondering what these two other elements had an effect, even possibly in producing this Zapatista movement. So I think, there's, I think you're saying a lot of different things that actually are in some ways very related. Um, in terms of the kind of alternative governments, or there's, there's something in Mexico called usas y costumbres, which is like traditions and cu customs and traditions uh -huh. that is, I think in some ways, like the official way of recognizing that indigenous communities have their own culture and tradition. And those are, have historically to some degree been recognized by the Mexican government. But I think are, have oftentimes also been kind of incorporated into the Mexican government's very sort of paternalistic style of politics. And with the PRI, like the PRI was the political party that held, part, that held power in, in Mexico for about 70 years from the Mexican Revolution up till when they lost the elections um, in 2000. In 2000. Um, and so a lot of times, like these indigenous authorities were very much part of kind of the pre-party machine, and so didn't necessarily really represent kind of an actual alternative. Mm -hmm. And so I think what, this, what makes the Zapatistas a little bit different from that, and I can't really compare with it in Guatemala, mm -hmm. because I don't know enough about it to make an accurate comparison. But the, the Zapatistas will say, we don't, want, we don't want authorities that are just indigenous. We want indigenous authorities that are actually um, oh. accountable to the people. Because just because someone's an indigenous leader doesn't by itself mean, may mean that they're you know, any more accountable to the people. So I think the fact that they, they, did, you know, they, do, they did really draw from those indigenous traditions, but they also were drawing from different kind of revolutionary traditions. And I think that goes back to the, the, the second, or kind of the last thing that you were saying, the people who originally went down to Mexico to from um, into Chiapas to, to start kind of the, the EZLN, the, the kind of parent organization was called the FLN, the Fuerzas de Liberación, Liberación Nacional, mm -hmm. the Forces of National Liberation. Mm -hmm. They were a much more traditional Marxist-Leninist group, mm -hmm. and they came out of the kind of student movement in the 70s in Mexico. So they went down to, Me they went down to Chiapas with that kind of traditional um, guerrilla idea like the Cuban Revolution of the sort of foco, you know, they would create guerrilla cells and that they would then have an uprising and then eventually overthrow the, the state, the Mexican state. And I think to their credit, once they got to Chiapas and realized that model was not going to be successful in that context, they were really able to, to sort of adapt some of their own revolutionary ideology to the history of indigenous resistance, to the campesino movements that were fighting for land, to the other Maoist groups that were down there at the time, to the diocese, the Catholic diocese had been doing a lot of organizing work. And sort of there was this really interesting mix. Um, and so I think that they really evolved and adapted over time. So, so you know, when I, you were saying I, I was referring them to them sort of as if it was a grassroots movement separate from their own. And that's not actually how much, I, how I see it so much as like, there were some outsiders who came in and to their credit, like I said, were able to kind of acknowledge the whole rich history of, of, of organizing that was already happening mm -hmm. and sort of add something to the mix that came up with something that was very successful. So there was kind of this very interesting you know, mix of different social movement traditions, different political traditions that included the communists, but also included all these other kind of political traditions, and then over time evolved into you know, what we would now call Zapatismo. Let me just see if anyone else has a question, and because it's 1 o'clock, and I, and I just, just to make to make sure we have time for others. Are you in the back, and then and then I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but. Uh, yeah, I have a question. You mentioned that uh, in the mid '90s, '94, I think, there was this movement about dispersed human rights. There was what? I'm sorry. A dispersed like a new idea of human rights for women, and that was very powerful and very powerful. Um, at the same time, in the global context, there was this Beijing conference where there, were, there was this model that is um, uh, wi uh, women's rights are human rights. So that was happening in the global context, but also we have this happening in a local 
Yeah. Do you think this was a reflection of what, what was happening at that time in a role, like, you know, more like including the other countries, or was happening like independently, you know, just on their own? Um, I would say probably indirectly related. Um, I think, you know, the different different kind of efforts happening to support women's rights around the world, I think inevitably kind of support each other. I don't think that the Zapatistas were directly influenced by Beijing, for example, mm. um, in the UN. I think they just sort of existed in a little bit of a different kind of context. Um, one of the things, like Isabel, actually, the, one of the women whose, whose testimony I read, she talked about reading um, other revolutionary stories and being really influenced by like the young Vietnamese um, revolutionaries whose stories she read. Um, so I think there was kind of more like cross-pollination from social movement to social movement than there was kind of from the UN in particular. But I think, like I said, indirectly, the fact that all those things were out in the world and were being pushed, I think inevitably just had did have an impact on each other. And I, I would say vice versa, right? Like the Zapatistas really putting that out to the world also really helped kind of those other efforts at the global level. Um, yeah, and I think the thing that you were mentioning that I was referring to was the, the women's revolutionary law, specifically, was passed kind of um, j just before 1994, like in 1993 leading up to the 94 uprising. But yes, there was this whole kind of discourse in general. Yeah, so I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, but kind of in general terms. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, kind of related what you were saying about globalization. Yeah. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Thank you. And then you had a question or a comment? I'm really interested in the um, autonomous education system. I was wondering if um, women's rights or gender equality was integrated into the curriculum. So, how exactly is it put into practice? And in practice, because you sort of mentioned the leaders, women are leaders, and then the women that sort of engage independently. But I wonder how the newer generations um, sort of are taught that this is something that should incorporate women's rights. Yeah, I mean, so there is, I didn't read very much from it. There is a whole chapter of my book that's about kind of the indigenous education and on and healthcare systems. Um, I think the ways that, that they talk about it the most are both in what we were talking about earlier in terms of like the real push to have girls and boys both come to school. And then the fact that there are women health promoters and education promoters, which wasn't the case in the past. Um, so women as adults, women's kind of participation in um, in those systems as, like I said, as, as health promoters, as education promoters, they have, they have worked on their own curriculum. I think that took longer because they were just kind of starting from scratch. So at the very beginning of the education, autonomous education system, they were still sort of borrowing from the sort of government texts because like they didn't have anything else to use as a model. So then over time they started really creating their own curriculum and incorporating more like their own history and their own culture. I don't know. I mean, I think probably like the 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 main thing that's there is um, is general references to kind of women's rights, like the women's revolutionary law. Um, this document that I did with the women, it wasn't actually intended so much for use with kids, but I think they ended up using it sometimes in the autonomous schools. Like they would just, you know, any document that they had that they created themselves was very valuable because, like I said, otherwise kind of the only textbooks that they had were the ones that already exist. Um, so what was originally kind of an organizing tool, I know at least in some cases they also used kind of in the autonomous schools, um, probably with some of the older students, not the younger ones. Um, but I, like, I don't know off the top of my head like more specifically than that in terms of the curriculum, but I know there was this whole process of kind of generating their own curriculum that would really res like reflect their own values. And I'm sure there is stuff in there about kind of women's rights but I, I don't know the kind of really more specifics than that. Sorry. So um, can I ask you to hold your thought? Maybe we could come up, if you could come up and talk about it afterwards, just because I want to sort of respect that. I think we're supposed to end at one, right? Yeah, I mean, probably we should finish off, yeah. Okay. Is it something quick? Maybe we just, and then we can wrap up after that. Did and or does the Catholic Church cooperate with Zapatista? Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, That's why I want to have an interesting Yes. <laughs> less, less so now. So from, the, from 1960 to 2000, uh -huh. um, the bishop of the Diocese of San Cristobal was a man named Samuel Ruiz. So while he was the bishop, um, you know, he came out of that sort of tradition of liberation theology mm -hmm. that was you know, somewhat common in Latin America in that time. 
Um, I'm not sure he would directly call himself a liberation theologist, but he had a lot of those same values of, you know, the church should be for the poor and, 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 um, and address injustice. And so the, 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 in the 60s and 70s and 80s, the church played a really important role in, you know, actually leading up to the Zapatista movement, yeah. laying some of the groundwork. Um, in 1974, there was this indigenous congress that was a really key moment in, in organizing the indigenous communities. And so in those, like from in the 70s and 80s, I think there was, now it's kind of acknowledged, at the time they would have denied it, that there was some coordination between the diocese and the EZLN. Um, but now it's kind of more documented, it's many years later. Um, and, and I think in particular with women's rights, there was a group called CODIMU, which was the Comisión de Asusana de Mujeres, so it was like the Women's Commission of the Diocese, where CODIMU and the EZLN were working together, were some of the areas where women's kind of rights and leadership really developed the most. Because I think that those two kind of institutions both had a different sort of moral weight with people. Um, but you know, and now the, I don't actually remember the name of the person who's bishop. The person who replaced Samuel Ruiz was definitely not quite as, you know, of the people as he was. So I think it doesn't have the same kind of commitment as it used to. But there's still some overlap. And there's a lot of people, you know, regardless of who the bishop is, there's a lot of people in the diocese who have that same commitment. Um, and there's been like NGOs that, that there's some overlap. So yeah, interesting question, thank you. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, I am happy to stick around if people want to chat more, if people want to buy copies of the books or you know, just chat, I'm, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit. I think my ride is here so I probably shouldn't stay super long time. But um, <laughs> oh, never mind, she said she'd be here in 10 minutes, never mind. <laughs> so thank you all so much. <laughs> And like Sarah mentioned, there's flyers about the program, there's these flyers about the other talks, and, or if you know people who didn't, couldn't, make, couldn't make it today but can make one of these other talks as well.